Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for our program tonight titled The History and Architecture of the Indianapolis Propylium. My name is Julia Black, and I am the Events and Marketing Director for the Indianapolis Propylium. The Propylium was founded in 1888 by renowned suffragist and activist May Wright Sewell as a place where women and women's groups could meet and share ideas. We continue on that tradition today through our mission as the place that connects and celebrates women. Our mission focus is women's leadership, arts and culture, and historic preservation. As a nonprofit, we count on your support to provide engaging programming like tonight. Please look at our website at www.thepropyleum.org for all of our upcoming awards, events, and to support the Propyleum. We hope that you will join us for our upcoming program. Our program this evening features Dr. Jim Glass. Dr. Jim Glass is an architectural historian and historic preservation and heritage consultant. His career has included positions as staff historian for the Indianapolis Historic Preservation Commission, director of the Indiana Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology, and director of the graduate program in historic preservation at Ball State University. He has written a monthly column on, on Indiana history and heritage for the Indianapolis Star since 2003 and authored books on the, on the history of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 and the gas boom in East Central Indiana. Jim previously served on the board of directors of the Propylium. Before we get started, please remember to keep your microphone muted throughout the duration of the presentation. Once Jim has finished, we will have time for a Q&A session at the end. Please type your questions into the, into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen throughout the program. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jim Glass. Thank you. Can everyone hear me, uh, Julia? Okay, good. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with so many friends and colleagues uh, with Indianapolis Propylium tonight and to talk to you about the history and architecture of the Indianapolis Propylium and the Schmidt Schaff House. Um, we're going to divide our, our topic in three, three different ways with some chapters. Uh, the first segment is going to be a history, uh, the history of the Indianapolis Propylium and Schmidt Schaff House. And we're gonna divide those into four chapters. First of all, chapter one, the original Propylaeum building from 1888 to 1923. Second chapter will deal with the present house that Propylaeum occupies during its first period under its original owners and builders, John W. and, and Lily Schmidt from about 1885, 1903. Chapter three will then cover what we might call the McCollum Mouse Shaft era at 1410 North Delaware Street. And then chapter four, the Indianapolis Propylium at 1410, 1923 to present. So that'll be the history of the two buildings uh, up to the present. Uh, the next part of our presentation will deal with the architecture of the main house and the carriage house. And then the third major part of our presentation will deal with changes in the interiors between 1903 and present. And that will deal with the interiors left from the Schmidt period. And then the changes were made during the McCullough, Mouse and Schaff period from 1903 to five. Well, chapter one, as I said, deals with the original Propylaeum Clubhouse from 1888 to 1923. And our story begins with the indomitable May Wright Sewell, uh, who was a figure locally, statewide, nationally, internationally in women's affairs, proponent of women's suffrage, and at the local level promoted social, cultural, literary, scientific, and artistic endeavors and particularly initiatives by women. Uh, May Wright Sewell in 1888 had visited the Milwaukee Women's Club, which who had just uh, built a clubhouse. She was so impressed with their building that she returned to Indianapolis and talked to her colleagues in the Indianapolis Women's Club and said, we should build a club, a, a building for Indianapolis women to showcase all manner of, of cultural, social, literary programs here in Indianapolis. And the idea caught fire. May Wright Sewell came up with the name for the organization, the Apple's Propyleum. Uh, what is Propyleum? Well, you see the, the symbol there uh, showing the, a, a, gr a Greek Doric portico, which symbolizes the original Propylaea in ancient Athens, which led up to the Acropolis Hill and to the Parthenon. 
One of May Wright Sewell's close associates, Margaret Shizlett, uh, characterized the purpose of the building in 1891 thusly. She said, we hoped that our building would be the portal through which many would enter and find their way, at least, to the outer courts of the temples of art, science, and all wisdom. Now, the way they raised money uh, to build their building was to sell stock in their organization. And the stock sales were limited to women. Uh, and uh, they were very successful. And by the time the building was underway, 400 stockholders had purchased stock in the Indianapolis Propylaeum. This is a stock certificate from some later years, but it does give you an idea of what the stock certificates look like. Well, the building committee of the Propylaeum in, uh, uh, solicited a drawing or design ideas from Indianapolis architects. And one submission that they particularly liked was submitted by uh, the Indianapolis architects, Adolph Scher and Scott Moore. Uh, and this is the design that they submitted. Uh, the, particularly prominently is, uh, you notice the central tower with this uh, faceted roof that projects up a limestone exterior with uh, rock face uh, character and uh, Romanesque arches. This is the building is actually built. You see some changes in the design. There's no longer this tall central tower. Instead, there's a, a, a gable, a Gothic gable, which slightly portrays above the other two on either side, three Gothic gables, contrasting with these uh, five Romanesque arches, which come out of the architecture, which is being made popular Romanesque architecture was being made popular in the 1890s by Henry Hobson Richardson, an architect in Boston. Now, what was in this building? Well, the first, the, the basement contained a, a, a sizable dining room, comfortable, spacious dining room, a kitchen, uh, and uh, several office space uh, uh, rooms. And it so happened that one of the first uh, persons to rent space in the basement was a woman physician. Uh, on the second level, there were th two parlors, two committee rooms, and on the third floor was the assembly hall. And if we entered the entrance hall, in, as it looked in 1896, you can see straight ahead of us, a very prominent stairway, which led up to the assembly hall with these two uh, very intriguing looking uh, newel posts with incised carvings. And to the left is a doorway that led into the east parlor, which we see here. We see a, a handsome oak uh, mantle with over mantle and mirror and these wooden beams overhead. Uh, this, each of these two parlors could each hold uh, 200 persons in a meeting. And then finally, the assembly hall, which is really the key room in the whole building, symbolizing the purpose of the, of the building in a way. And in this uh, building, in this room, we see there's a, a central fireplace, the Romanesque arch, they're all good sight lines, no columns to interrupt your sight lines because the weight of the ceiling was borne by these steel trusses. Now, what was, what was kinds of events were held in here? Well, the Art Association of Indianapolis held art exhibitions in this room. Uh, the Dramatic Club of Indianapolis held dramatic productions. It was a stage one end. Uh, and there were major public lectures and other meetings uh, hosted by women. Now, for over 30 years, the board of the Indianapolis Propylaeum managed this uh, facility very effectively. Uh, they paid the operating costs from rentals uh, and uh, the board uh, you see here in about 1920. This uh, photo is from 1923, the final meeting of the membership of the Propylaeum uh, in the East Parlor. Why was it their final meeting? Well, there are a lot of changes that were happening uh, during this period. World War I had happened a few, few, just a few years later, earlier. And during that period, the Propylaeum hosted veterans, or excuse me, soldiers, uh, as a sort of a social center. After the war was over, the American Legion, uh, led by Indiana members of this veterans organization of World War I veterans, they led the way in uh, getting the National Headquarters of the Legion to be located in Indianapolis. And more than that, to build a, a, a monumental five block long World War I plaza to commemorate the valor and sacrifice of World War I veterans. How does that concern the Propylaeum? Well, one of the blocks that they were to use uh, was, was where the Propylaeum stood on North Street uh, downtown. So the city of Indianapolis was helping out in the project by buying out all the property in this block 
on which the Purple Lamb stood. The city offered the Indianapolis Purple Lamb $68,000 for their property, which the Purple Lamb accepted. The Purple Lamb then had to move, more about that later. Uh, that was in 1923. In 1928, the state of Indiana demolished all the buildings in the square in order to create the obelisk square part of the plaza. So that brings us to chapter two in our historical segment. This chapter is gonna deal with the period of time in the present building, the present house, uh, in which John W. and Lily Schmidt uh, built and lived in the house uh, from about 1885 to 1903. Our story begins with the, uh, an, a German immigrant, Christian Schmidt. He immigrated to Indianapolis in the 1850s and founded in about 1859, co-founded a brewery uh, which was called the C.F. Schmidt Brewery. He was an entrepreneur and a risk taker who took risks, but was successful. He served on the city council of Indianapolis in the 1860s uh, and was uh, built the brewery up uh, substantially until his early death in 1872. This uh, newspaper ad tells us about the brewery. It says C.F. Schmidt, brewer and bottler of Lager and the celebrated Wiener Beer, south end of Alabama Street. This uh, Sanborn insurance map plan shows us the layout of the C.F. Schmidt Brewery in 1887. Uh, we see it had several parts. There's a beer cellar with ice machines in it, a red brick. Uh, over here, we have a, another brick building, which included beer coolers, beer storage, and ice house had to keep the beer cold, a wash house, presumably for washing the beer bottles. And I want to direct your attention to this dwelling here, this red brick dwelling. This was the boyhood home of Christian, well, it was Christian Schmidt's home and the boyhood home of his two sons, John and Edward. You can see the, this long brick building, two-story brick building, uh, and then this, or at right angles, is this cottage coming out at an angle. Here is the older of the two sons, John W. Schmidt, born in 1855. He went, attended school, the German-English school in Indianapolis, and eventually made his way to Germany, where he studied music. Uh, for two years, and then he returned and entered the family business. Um, he, in 1885, was married to Lily Schudel. This is a person he had known all of his life because Lily Schudel had been an orphan, and John Schmidt's mother had, uh, uh, had raised her as her ward, so he'd known her most of his life. They were married on August 4th, 1885. This news article tells us a little bit about the marriage ceremony. It uh, took place at the residence on South Alabama Street. Uh, more about that in a minute. And here is Lily Sch uh, Schmidt, along with John. And it, it so happened that with the prosperity of the C.S. Schmidt Brewery, the two brothers co-managed the brewery in the 1880s. Uh, John Schmidt was able to afford to build a large mansion, a, a very a large and impressive mansion, which we see the facade of here on Alabama Street. I want to direct your attention to the, this, hap, this was built sometime in the 1880s, maybe closer to 1885 or 86. Draw your attention to this two-story porch with a tower that you can't see overhead. And then at the center is this projecting pavilion, it's called, coming out with this Gothic-like gable with limestone coping and terracotta decoration, and then sandstone uh, string courses to contrast with the rest red pressed brick um, uh, exterior walls. Here is the south elevation. We're just looking at Alabama Street. This is the side of the house that faced McCarty Street. See, it was a very large house, the pyramidal roof. I want to direct your attention particularly to these two projecting pavilions that come out. Uh, and this one in particular has a chimney that goes up through the apex of the gable. And then there's this bowed window at the, at the very first, at the first story, first floor. And then here's this two-story porch with this uh, tower, imposing tower with this faceted roof. Now, the architect of this mansion, uh, we think, was Adolf Scher of Indianapolis, we, who we saw earlier designing the Indianapolis Purple Land building co-designing co it. Uh, why do we think this? Well, if you go upstairs in the Purple Lamb to one of the rooms there, there is a composite of photos, historical photos, which show the photos I just showed you of the mansion. And the caption says the architect was Adolf Scher. And this must have been based on information in the family, which long ago was given to the people who made up the composite. So I think that's fairly reliable. 
Well, one of the curious things about the history of this house is the, uh, of, the, of this house, this saga, is that having built this monument, this very uh, imposing brick mansion at great expense, John Schmidt, only a four or five years later, built another mansion as large or larger than the original one on the north side at what is now 14th and Delaware Street. Uh, in January 1890, uh, he uh, bought this very large parcel here we see in 1887 for $8,700. And he then proceeded to build this second, a second mansion. Uh, why did they, why do you think he was building a mansion? Well, my theory is that he and Lily uh, wanted to live in the fashionable North side and were not, did not enjoy the commercialized, industrialized atmosphere down at Alabama, McCarty Street. Anyway, this uh, eight, June 1891 article in the Indianapolis Journal uh, shows a sketch of the house uh, being completed in June 1891, the cost of $65,000. And I think you can see already some similarities between the two houses with the, the, this two-tiered porch and this large three-story tower with a faceted roof. This is the earliest photograph we have of 1410 North Delaware Street from 1893. And again, I want to point out the features of this, that this two-tiered porch, ionic columns in the second tier, and then this rounded uh, tower, three-story tower with a faceted roof, uh, a gable, Gothic gable limestone coping, uh, very similar to what we saw on Alabama Street, something different here, this large, impressive Romanesque entryway for the, for the entry, uh, and then these two pavilions on the south side. Here is another photo from 1896, three years later in the winter, taking the winter time. And I think you can see these two projecting pavilions on the south side better here. And notice the similarity. We've got a chimney protruding through the gable, apex of the gable, um, a terracotta decorative detail, and this bowed window at the base. Now, if we look at the Sanborn insurance plans of these two mansions, I think we can see the similarities even further. This is, from 1887 is the plan for the original mansion at Alabama McCarty. You can see it's a large red brick building. At the corner, at this corner, it has a three-story rounded tower and it's showing a one-story rounded, um, a one-story rounded porch uh, which is an error because there's actually two stories as we've seen. And then there are two pav projecting pavilions, another small error, it doesn't show the bowed window here, but otherwise uh, this is a very close, uh, has a close resemblance to the later house. Here is the plan for the uh, 1410 North Delaware Street house and notice the similarities here, a three-story rounded tower. Here they're correctly showing a two-story rounded frame porch and then these two projecting pavilions and they're accurately showing the rounded bowed window. These photographs sort of enhance the comparison. We've seen this photo before of that mansion on the facade side of the mansion on McCarty Street. And here shows in 1896, these, uh, the, the south side of this house. Again, notice these parallel uh, pavilions. They're almost mirror images really looking at the south elevation uh, with the tower and the, conic the faceted roof of the two-tiered porches at the corner. Now, my conclusion, based on all of these resemblances, is that the same architect designed both houses, and that architect was probably Adolf Scher. What did he design? Else did he design? Uh, well, uh, among his largest uh, commissions was he served as supervising architect of the Indiana State House, the current Indiana State House. He had been born in the German part, German speaking part of Switzerland. He immigrated to this country and gone to work for an Indianapolis, an Indianapolis architect named Edwin May. Edwin May won a national competition to design the state house, but died only a year after winning the competition. And they selected his chief draftsman, Adolf Scher, to be the supervising architect. So this was quite a monumental project for him to oversee. Uh, also, he in 1885 uh, designed the waiting station at Crown Hill Cemetery. And we can see some similarities in the mansions, that is red pressed brick with these Gothic-like gables at the corners, at these two corners, uh, and then limestone trim at uh, contrasting with the red brick. He also, as we've seen, 
uh, uh, designed the uh, Indianapolis, original Indianapolis Purple Lamb building. And he designed the old pathology building at uh, what was called the Indiana, Indiana Hospital for the Insane in 1895. Now, one of the interesting things about this family is the two brothers were very close. Uh, they were close enough that they shared, they lived, they shared the, both mansions. John and Edward lived in the original mansion. And then when the new mansion was built for some time, Edward lived there also with John and Lily in the same house. But by 1895, Edward was ready for his own home. So according to the information upstairs in the Propylaeum, uh, Adolf Scher designed a house at 3106 North Meridian Street in a Queen Anne style for Edward Schmidt, which you see here. Now we've seen the plan for the 1410, the original plan for 1410 North Delaware before. Uh, let's now take a look at the carriage house uh, at the southwest corner of the property, one of the larger carriage houses built in, at that time in that period. Um, and we can see that the northeast corner of this was the carriage house. Remember, this was the horse-drawn age of carriages for well-to-do people. So this portion of the building was used to store the carriages. This portion with the X's was the stable where the horses were kept. And then the northwest section was the laundry, plus I think also some of the servants must have lived there. Now, John and Edward Schmidt, during the 1880s, continued to manage the Christian Schmidt Brewery. About 1890, they sold the brewery to an English syndicate that was buying up breweries. The syndicate also bought two other German-American breweries, a mouse brewery and the lever brewery. And interestingly enough, when they created a subsidiary to operate it in Indianapolis, the Indianapolis Brewing Company, John W. Schmidt became the president. And he was president up through the 1890s. After that point, he and his brother devoted most of their attention and business to investing in real estate downtown. Here is an advertisement from the third floor of the Propylaeum showing uh, the, uh, an advertisement for the Indianapolis Brewing Company about 1900. And this is a somewhat um, improbable, massive concentration of brewery buildings. I think actually this was a composite of the three complexes that were actually in separate locations of the three breweries that merged to form the Indianapolis Brewing Company. Now, in that period, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, the husband often in a well-to-do family would be involved in business, spend much of his time outside the home. Uh, the wife would manage the household, uh, be engaged in civic, some civic affairs, and uh, host social occasions involved in committee works and so on. Uh, Lily Schmidt was no exception, and she held several uh, different functions, social functions in this house while they lived there. Here's one in 1901. This news article reports on a musical that Mrs. John W. Schmidt will give tomorrow afternoon in a residence on North Delaware Street. A year later, she was hosting a large card party uh, in her home, her spacious home, it says, and it names the guest of honor. It says a profusion of flowers and a green plants decorated the hallways and the parlors, plural. Now, in 1903, after 12 years of living in this mansion, the Schmitz decided to sell it. They sold it to George McCullough in June 1903 for $85,000. This news article from the Indianapolis Journal shows us something very interesting, and that is it documents that as of 1903, when the Schmitz sold the property, it's, it had its original design with these, this two-tiered porch and this three-story brick tower with a faceted roof. The Schmitz moved exactly one block south to the northwest corner of Delaware and 13th Street to this brick Queen Anne house, probably built in the 1880s, uh, and resided there. And nine years later, John W. Schmidt died at the young age of 57 in that house. Which brings to close the, the, the chapter of the Schmitz family uh, in 1410 North Delaware Street. Our chapter three in the th historical section then deals with the McCullough Mouse a shaft how, a era at 1410 from 1903 to 1923. Uh, this uh, era begins with the ownership of George McCullough. George McCullough, you see here, was born and raised in Muncie, Indiana, uh, entered business in Muncie, and uh, in due course founded the Muncie Star newspaper. He then came to Indianapolis, where he quickly became a major factor in the streetcar companies of Indianapolis and co-founded the Indianapolis Star and the, and the Terre Haute Star. So he had uh, his finger in a number of business uh, affairs. 
Uh, after only owning this property and perhaps living in it for one year, McCullough sold it. Uh, he sold it uh, to Mad a woman named Madeline Mouse in October 1904 for $76,000. This news article is quite significant, quite interesting. It says that um, McCullough had bought the house some time ago and had, and had started to remodel the house, but abandoned the work. Miss Mouse will complete the work of remodeling and she, with Mr. and Mrs. Joseph C. Schaff, will occupy the place. Miss Mouse and Mrs. Schaff are sisters. There's a lot of interesting information packed into that. Now, who were was Madeline Mouse? Madeline Mouse's father was Casper Mouse, who had another German um, immigrant who had founded another brewery in Indianapolis, the C. Mouse Brewery, on West New York Street, uh, where IUPUI currently is. Now, this 1885 advertisement uh, tells us this about C.S. Mouse. It says it's brewers, their brewer and bottler of Mouse's celebrated Lager and Taffil beer. Now we've talked about four German American breweries. There's actually a fifth one. And that was headed by Madeline Mouse's brother-in-law, Joseph C. Schaff, we see here. He was president of the American Brewing Company on West Market Street. And as I said, uh, this extended family, M Madeline Mouse, who bought the house and her brother and sister-in-law and their family lived in the house uh, together. Uh, these floor plans are these plans uh, from 1898, which we've seen before, and 1914 of the 1410 North Delaware Street show us the changes that occurred. Um, the boxes here on the right are going to cover this up a little bit, but uh, remember the three-story tower and the two-story uh, por porch on the original house from 1898. Over here, we can see that all of a sudden that now there's no tower there at all. Instead, this corner has become squared and there is a rounded porch, but it's only one story and extends and covers the entryway. The photos uh, document this further. 1896 photo, remember the two-tiered porch and the three-story tower with a faceted roof. And here, so today, you can see there's no tower, squared corner, and then this rounded porch, but no second story to it. Now, the Madeleine Mouse and the Shafts also made some significant changes to the carriage house. This is a comparison of the plan uh, from 1898 and 1914. During the time that the um, Mouse and uh, Mass Shaft uh, family lived uh, here was the revolution from the, from the carriage drawn age to the automobile age. And we can see this in the changes they made to the carriage house because they took out the carriage house uh, structure, merged it with the stable and converted the, the, the L-shaped space to an automobile garage for one or more automobiles. And then the laundry became a dwelling, I think an expanded uh, apartments uh, for the uh, chauffeur and other servants. Now, uh, just as the Schmitz had done, this, the Miss Mouse, the Madeline Mouse and the Shafts uh, entertained regularly in their house, um, uh, Rose Wernicke found this article uh, about uh, the daughter, Alice Schaff, having her debut party in the house in 1909. It tells us about the, the decorations in the house. Uh, and then uh, in 1916, there was another big social affair when Alice Schaff was married to Hervey Bates, uh, a big society wedding in the house. Now, changes were happening in the 19-teens. Uh, a lot of changes in, in the Indianapolis economy and society. One change was that the near north side was becoming invaded by commercialization. Automobile uh, dealerships, uh, garages, and uh, uh, filling stations, among other things. And so some of the well-to-do families were moving to north out of this neighborhood. Uh, also, Madeline Mouse died in 1918 or 19. And so by 1921, Joseph Schaff was ready to sell the property. He sold it to the Indiana College of Music and Fine Arts in 1921. Uh, this uh, college was, had visions of, of creating a performing arts center in the, in the mansion, but they were unable to make the payments on contract. And so the property reverted to Joseph Schaff. And that brings the close uh, chapter three about the, the, uh, the McCullough-Miles Schaff era. 
We're now ready to talk about, uh, to, to deal with chapter four, which is Indianapolis Propyleum at 1410, 1923 to present. Uh, this bass photo at the Indian Historical Society shows us what the property looked like about the time that it was sold. It was sold uh, two year, three years later, or two years later, Joseph Schaff sold it to the Indianapolis Propyleum uh, 1923 for $92,000. Remember, they had received $68,000 from the city of Indianapolis for their original building. They were able to gather other funds together to finance the purchase, and it became their home. Now, we're fortunate to have bass photos, the Historical Society, that were taken about 1924 that documented at the end of its residential period and also with some beginning of some changes that the purple land were making. Uh, this is the stair hall uh, with this distinctive dark stained wood. Uh, wainscoting and stairway with this newel post. Uh, here is what the, uh, in the residence period, they called the music room, also the propylaeum called it the music room in the southeast corner. We're looking into what uh, the propylaeum called the club room. They created this by uh, taking down the wall between the library and the billiard room to create one large room. The northeast room was what was called the reception uh, room or the, the drawing room and see it as it looked in 1924. It also had a large uh, doorway, which led into the stair hall. And then finally, looking very much as it did when the family occupied it, is the family dining room, uh, fully, fully furnished. Now, the Propylaeum had visions of doing great things with this property. Uh, one of their uh, dreams was to build an auditorium on the rear of the building, uh, the house. Remember, they had an auditorium in the original building and to make some other changes to the house. But they were unable to come, to come up with the money to do this. And so they focused on the carriage house and did make some changes there. Uh, this is a Sanborn insurance map uh, showing the, the, the property in 56. Uh, I want to see there's very few changes in the house. I want to draw your attention though to the changes happening that had happened uh, in the 1920s in the carriage house. Compare the 1914 plan, 1956, you can see that the propylaeum uh, had taken out the garage, the auto garage in this northeast corner had made a two-story space with a balcony for uh, rental, rental purposes and for receptions. And then storerooms were installed in the, the southern portion of the building. Uh, and then in the northwest section uh, was converted into more residential townhouse and residential uh, spaces. Now, this brings us into the third major segment, a second major segment of the presentation, dealing with the architecture of the main house and the carriage house. And the first slide we're going to look at that shows the property uh, at the corner, a very large corner property, one of the largest corner properties of 1891 for a residential, for a large residence, uh, measuring by 270 feet by 202 feet. You take a closer look at the house, you can see it's, you might say it combines. Uh, two architectural styles, English Queen Anne and Romanesque. Uh, English Queen Anne comes uh, largely derives from the work of the English architect, Richard Norman Shaw. Uh, in his urban houses in particular, he, he delighted in using uh, red brick for his building material, often with a stone for string courses, which we see here, and going around the, the, the house, uh, and then gables like this, often with terracotta adornment. Uh, and then if we take a look at the facade, we can see more evidence of that where the sandstone in the case of the Schmidt Schaff house uh, are used as string courses. And then of course, another one of these gables, which is very much like Richard Norman Shaw's work in England. And then also this is an opportunity to see the, 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 the new 1903 to five porch, which continued all in front of the entryway. And if we approach the entrance, we see this magnificent arch over the entranceway, particularly want to draw your attention to these bas relief stone sculptures of this branch with these flowing leaves, and then these uh, multiple columns or pier pillars with organic capitals. Now we take a closer look at, at, at the one of the south uh, pavilions in Schmidt Schaff House. We can see that again, this chimney goes to the apex of the gable. This is elaborate organic a terracotta a decorative uh, triangular at the, at the apex, a smaller one on the chimney. And then I want to direct your attention to this bowed 
uh, window that comes out and bows for these uh, bows at the, the first story of the, the base of this pavilion. This idea of a bowed front uh, may very well have been taken by uh, Scherer from the bowed fronts of mansions in the Back Bay in Boston of the 19th century. Uh, this is very similar. Take a cl close look at one of the gables. You can see the elaborateness and the artistry of the, uh, the both the terracotta and the stone sculpture. That this is terracotta, the baked ceramic material, which if ba baked in decorative molds could form almost could form almost any kind of form. Uh, here we see this delightful palmette in this intricate organic detail. And in stone, we see very similar deal details below it. And in the frieze of the bowed um, window, we can see these volute-shaped organic designs going in a, a succession here, forming a delightful terracotta frieze. And above that, uh, limestone dentals, or yes, I think those were limestone dentals, a sandstone below. The, the 18, 1903 to 1905 porch, um, it's a possible that some of these columns today were in the original porch. I've not been able to verify that. They look somewhat similar. But in any event, note this smooth shaft, these sand, are sandstone. The capital section sort of uh, flares a bit and has this organic detail similar to what's over the entrance way. It's also very similar to these large columns in the porte cochere on the side with more organic detailing and a pediment overhead. This was one of the larger uh, port cochers used to shelter the carriages in the case of inclement weather uh, in the city at the time. The carriage house is one of the, is one of the largest, if not the largest, of its period. Uh, and the share designed it to complement the major of the house. You can see this in the use of the red press brick, the sandstone string courses, and then these round arched uh, Romanesque arches would, are blind because they're bricked up inside. And then another feature, which is sort of contrasts, are these uh, multiple frame dormers with uh, brackets. We look from the 14th Street, we see the changes that were made by the Propyleum in the 1920s, namely storefronts that they added, uh, concluding these Georgian style entryways with segmental pediments overhead. Uh, an even more elaborate version over the main entrance into the carriage house with these Corinthian pilasters. Now, remember, I said this, we're looking now on the north side of the carriage house. This is where, uh, up until the 1920s, there was a stable opening, or excuse me, there was a sta an opening to the, into the carriage house here, for the carriages could roll in from the, from the north. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, this was partially bricked up in order to create this large window. Uh, in the reception space within. And it's also a very handsome pediment overhead. Northwest corner has uh, this pavilion, which repeats some of the details of the major carriage house structure, uh, namely the sandstone string courses and these uh, two uh, parallel uh, Romanesque arches that are blind. This brings us to the final third major segment of presentation, changes in the interiors, uh, 1903 to present. First, we're going to look at what is remains from the Schmidt interiors of the 1410 North Delaware Street house. One of the major spaces, which is remains intact from the Schmidt period, is the uh, major corridor that goes through east-west, goes through the entire house uh, with this handsome uh, stained oak uh, wainscoting and trim. And here is the stair wall uh, with, again, the, 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 the wainscoting and this intricate uh, balustrade of interlinking le uh, oaken uh, circles uh, coming at different angles. Another thing which dates the Schmidt period, without any doubt, are these handsome doors, solid doors, oak doors, uh, stained in this dark color, uh, with multiple styles of rails they're called, and panels, and then Corinthian uh, capitals here on the trim. Now, my hypothesis is that the Schmitz uh, wanted all naturalist stained wood, uh, oak, uh, wood in their first floor, that the staining was actually done during the remodeling done by uh, Mouse, uh, McCullough, Mouse, and Schaff. You can see evidence of this when you go to the rear stair hall, because here is an identical door and surround to what we just saw, but with natural oak staining, further uh, substantiated by the rear stairway which has got the natural oak stain. 
Another, another original room of the Schmidt period was somewhat altered is the former library. The walls, the west wall has been removed, but still has this rounded, remember the rounded bowed uh, windows, uh, which is a delightful space uh, for the, this room. Overhead, in the 1990s, uh, original paintings were discovered underneath a painted, a painted over surface. And uh, these painted surfaces were repainted and restored. The next room, which was present in the Schmidt period, was the billiard room, uh, where the gentleman in the household presumably played billiards. Uh, it has the original trim around the doorways and door, uh, and probably the original fireplace. And if you look up, you can see a similar situation where what's believed to be the Schmidt painting for the ceiling was discovered in the 1990s and repainted to be restored. Up in the second floor corridor, more of the Schmidt period, uh, the oak trim and floor. And if you go into this bedroom, I believe this is the original bedroom uh, with the original mantle with these uh, consoles are called painted white uh, and the door. And then on the third floor, the ballroom, I think much of the space probably it does date, date back to the Schmidt period. Uh, we know uh, from the 1909 article uh, about Alice Schaff's coming out party that they went, part of the party included the third floor ballroom, which is what they called it. So we do know it was used as a ballroom during the residential period. Now we've established what was in the Schmidt period. Now let's look at what cha the changes that the McCullough Mouse Schaff ownership uh, made in the house uh, between 1903 and five. First of all, uh, I believe uh, that uh, the, the either the, the mouses and the shafts hired uh, an eminent interior decorator, William F. Behrens of New York, who originally originated in Cincinnati, one of the top interior decorators of the country at the time. Uh, to oversee the redesign uh, in the interior of this house. Uh, this 192 article documents that Barron's was in town in Indianapolis about the same time for two projects. One, decorating the original Columbia Club of 1900 in the circle. And secondly, right at the time the remodeling of the house was occurring, he was engaged in interior design on the new Claypool Hotel. A 1974 newspaper article documents the connection to the, to, to the um, Propylaeum uh, house, it says that William Behrens uh, conducted the re remodeling uh, during the early 20th century of the 1410 North Delaware Street house. Now, these wrought iron tree sculptures are exquisite. They're one of the, one of the most wonderful artistic elements in the entire property. And unfortunately, we do not know who the artist was. Presumably, it was an artist uh, adept at, cast, uh, at uh, designing and casting wrought iron. Perhaps William Behrens design, made a design and, and an artist carried it out. But it's got this wonderfully three-dimensional flowing leaves on this tree and these tendril-like roofs, uh, really a masterpiece. Now, the north, the southeast corner room is where there was remodeling, definitely happened. The whole room was uh, dates to Barron's efforts. Remember that there was a rounded tower at this corner. Uh, it's no longer there. There's now a square corner. So that was one reason to remodel it. Sort of a loosely, I would call it a, a, a 17th century French Baroque theme Barron's used. Uh, it has these plaster pilasters uh, with these imaginative capitals. Uh, which are somewhat loosely based on classical architecture, uh, this elegant cartouche. And then these are bundled rods uh, encased in ribbons at the very top in the cornice. And if you look up, you see a, another element uh, present in some 17th century French chateaus, the 17th century uh, cove ceiling. Across the hall is the other major room that Barron's redesigned. 1903, 1905, uh, that's the reception hall, reception room, a drawing room. Uh, this he redesigned in the Louis XV style, first half of the 18th century. Uh, it's a very formal style with these panels, with these upraised uh, moldings around the edges of them, uh, mirror and mantle, all encased and worked into the design. Two cornices, a lower cornice and an upper cornice, and between them, rosettes, these are called a frieze of rosettes. And then if you look up, you see the masterpiece of the room, namely these French rococo low-relief, bas-relief plaster 
organic uh, uh, sculptures in plaster at each of the four corners, uh, also typical of the early 18th century. I also believe that uh, the, 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 the mouse and the shafts uh, re redesigned the family dining room during this period in the Italian Renaissance style. We see elements of this in this cornice with these uh, medallions, or, or they're really medallions rather than dentals, are on the sides of the room, uh, a very elegant buffet with consoles. But if you look over to the other side, you see the highlight of the room, which is this fireplace with some Renaissance elements overhead. But look at the overmantel over the hearth, which is an exquisite bas relief uh, terracotta uh, um, uh, sculpture uh, by the eminent um, Pottery Works, Rookwood, Rookwood Pottery Works of Cincinnati, one of the top uh, companies of their kind in the Midwest. And these are flamingos that they created with multicolors. You look up, you see a wooden ceiling, which has been carved with these arabesque uh, designs, also comes out of the Italian Renaissance. And if you go to the Southwest meeting room, you'll see another terracotta fireplace, which may very well be Rookwood. We don't have documentation of that. There's also a prairie style uh, a window, a somewhat arts and crafts, uh, which was put into uh, the door separating the rear stair wall with the, with the coat rack hall, we'll call it, um, which uh, uh, has elements, leaded glass elements of the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. Now upstairs in the Southeast bedroom is another place affected by the remodeling, removal of the tower. So the tower is gone, the corner is squared, and, but I do think they uh, kept the original mantle because it's so similar to the mantle we looked at in the other uh, bedroom. And finally, the final change that the mouses and, and the Miss Mouse and uh, the shafts uh, made, I think, was to the ceiling of the library. Now you have to, this is a somewhat confusing history. Um, I get what we assume is that originally the Schmitz painted this, had artists paint this ceiling on plaster, but this uh, ceiling, which is uh, Tudor and Jacobean style strap work from the country houses of the Jacobean period, exquisite with uh, these squiggly lines forming cells, these uh, upraised plaster moldings, excellent work. Um, my supposition is that this, uh, this uh, design was added to the ceiling uh, during the remodeling period. And then sometime during the propylaeum ownership, it was removed back to a flat surface. And when that was uh, peeled away, they, they uh, found the original painting. So that's sort of a mystery, which that's my hypothesis about it. Well, I hope this has given you an idea of the, about the interesting history of both the original building in Yappos Propylaeum and the Schmidt Schaff House, the and many uh, interesting people who were involved with it and the many changes that have occurred and uh, the connection to the South Side of Indianapolis, et cetera. Uh, in closing, I'd like to show you uh, the sources I use for both my research and for the photos. Thank you very much.